Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Local Chat. Joining me today, as always, is my faithful companion, Ian Gibson. Ian, how are you? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. How are you, Will? I'm doing deliciously. And also joining us very last minute is David, whose last name I don't remember. He didn't tell you. He didn't tell me, folks. <laughs> it's David Video Games. <laughs> Uh, we were going to have uh, Subpixel co-founder Kyle on today, but unfortunately his SSD has hurt itself. So we don't know what the problem is. And I was just on the Around the Monitor podcast with David and I messaged him the chat. I said, does anyone want to be on a podcast? So uh, <laughs> he kindly said no. Uh, and then I, I slipped him a 50. So now he's here. He uh, did? <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe it was Chris. <laughs> Uh, and we're hanging out. <clears throat> Ooh, man, I'm a little flustered. Uh, I was saying this on their podcast, Ian. I was genuinely like nervous at being on a thing, and oh, like I do this all the time. <laughs> it was so yeah. weird. Um, folks, uh, we're gonna talk about some good things today. But first, I'm gonna peek my microphone. First, we're gonna talk about what we have been playing. Anyways, we're going to talk about what we've been playing. Ian, what have you been playing? Um, so I didn't want to talk about Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War after I uh, ranted and raved about it for a solid five minutes last episode. But here's the thing. I finished the game. I had like maybe like 10, 15% of the game left, the single player. Um, and that game surprised me because it actually did kind of a 180 and became very good at the end. It, it's uh i'm not going to spoil it but it did a whole lot of really weird things uh things that like like control when some other games have done like stanley parable where all of a sudden you have an unreliable narrator and you have like time freezing and skipping you have reality bending things so you're not sure what you can trust in terms of level design you know you go through a door and you're in a different location all sorts of really weird creepy stuff that's happening and then you're presented with a choice and as far as i can tell i mean i didn't do all the endings but it seems like the choice actually matters and there are very different endings. Um, so I don't want to spoil it, but I do just want to say game probably still not worth paying full price for and playing, but if you find it on sale, I would recommend playing it just because of those last few missions. Uh, it did some, some crazy stuff. Uh, Will or David, have you guys happened to play uh, black ops cold war? No, I haven't touched call of duty See, in a long time. <laughs> so you guys are much smarter than me. I, I, um, <laughs> I touched it because I thought maybe it had gotten better and it it had not. But that last 10% of the single player campaign was really good. Um, so coming off that, I was like, you know what? I'm going to play some more FPS. So then I played a little bit of Titanfall 2 because we talked about it last week. I played the first two missions. Still a great game, but I don't think I'm going to replay all of them. Um, and then I switched over to Darkest Dungeon because we talked about Darkest Dungeon last week and I need a video game to play before Hitman 3 comes out. And... I played an hour of Darkest Dungeon, and that was it. Um, That's it? I really, I really wanted to like Darkest... Have you guys played Darkest Dungeon? I haven't. I know I what it is, but I haven't played it. I, like, I, I really wanted to like it. I have a good friend who... He gets sucked into video games. So for a while, he was playing like Crusader Kings 2 just all day, every day for like six months. That'll do um, it. <laughs> yeah. And... Before that, I think it was Mountain Blade uh, Warband. And like his latest was Darkest Dungeon. And so he kept talking about it. And I was like, okay, finally, I'll give it a shot. But it was actually really disappointing because they have a tutorial section, but they throw way too much stuff at you. Like they have this segment where they're like, you know, to do an attack, use one of your skills. Mouse over your skill to get a description. And you mouse over the skill and it's just like, six lines of stat text and it's just like bcc plus minus cc acc dmg mle and it's just like what does any of this mean you're not telling me what any of this means and i don't know how to play this game and so that that was like i'm sure the game is great if you understand all those things i do not i don't have time for that so i just i put it away i said you're you're very you know aesthetically great game they kind of have like a bastion trend transistor type um narrator who, who's like uh, providing a lot of character on top 
but man, they got to they really got to work on introducing those mechanics and stat blocks and all that cuz it was not friendly. Um but there's one game that I did play that I stuck with that I did finish this week called Piku Niku. Have you guys played this? It's on Game Pass. Oh, I know. I've seen it. Did you play mm-hmm. co-op or solo? I did solo because I my fiance's not good at video games and I would just yell at her the whole time. So I figure for the safety of our relationship, I should probably just not play with her, you know. Um, I wonder how the co-op goes. I mean, the co-op's probably the same. It's just kind of, you're just kind of running around in this guy. So, so Piku Niku is, it's a 2D, very artsy game. The art style is, I mean, I think it's like Katamari Damacy almost art style, even though it's 2D. It just has a lot of that, 2D. like, like, uh, like texture and flavor and art style and, and aesthetic and like joyfulness to it um and so it's like a platformer but it's also kind of like undertale where in undertale you're kind of just going around the world and talking to people and then like kind of helping them out with things so there are like quote unquote platform sections but it's not really about platforming um but yeah incredibly cute game it's on game pass i think it only took me like three hours to beat it i there are some moments in that game that are just like genuinely hilarious it's just really, really cute. Highly recommend it. Um, the other thing I've been playing, I'm going to wait for Will to talk about. Um, but yeah, that's that's been pretty much it for, for my week. I just kind of danced around trying to find a game that would stick with me because, like I said, Hitman 3 comes out next week, and that's all I want to play. And I just got to burn <laughs> time before. I'm very excited <laughs> for it. Awesome. Uh, David, uh, since... Uh... Kyle's not here. You have to say you played all the games he played. No. Um, oh, that'd be bad. I can't talk about any of those. Uh, <laughs> um, I, what do you mean? You weren't playing the Red Dead Redemption 2 story? Um, if you uh, have been playing anything, what have you been playing this week? Oh, man. I've been playing a bunch of stuff. I just finished Persona 5 Royal at the end of the year. And so mm. I've been playing shorter games. So I played Bug Snacks, which was great. Yeah. Uh, I played what I play after Bugs next. Uh, the Pathless, which I also enjoyed, mm-hmm. wasn't like fantastic, but but I enjoyed it. And then this week I played Ratchet and Clank from 2016, the the newer one. Since the sequel is coming out sometime this year, maybe. Uh, cool. I wanted to actually give. I'd never played a Ratchet and Clank game, period. So I wanted to give uh, the newer one a shot to decide if I wanted to play the new new one. And uh, it's not bad. I, I kind of enjoyed it. It's not like my favorite thing. It definitely feels kind of PS2-y still. Mm-hmm. Even though it's yeah. like we're in the 2010s, about to be in the 2020s. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, it definitely still feels old. It has that old charm to it. And I don't mean charm necessarily in a good way most of the time. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's fun. The characters are pretty good. Uh, it it's got the right amount of like jankiness to it, where it still mm-hmm. kind of feels indie without being indie. Uh, and some of the weapons are just f- so fun. <laughs> There's a Groovachan that's just a disco ball that makes people dance, and they take more damage. <laughs> it's pretty great. And there is a Sheepinator. It does what you think it does. Perfect. <laughs> is that the game that was tied in to the Ratchet and Clank movie? Yep. There are very clear moments of tie into the movie. <laughs> They're not at all subtle. Uh, they they straight up reference the movie in like some really funny ways. Like this game does actually have some good comedy. Like they're they're it's very self aware that it's a movie tie in. Mm-hmm. Uh, and for whatever reason, they block all the cutscenes for recording on PlayStation. I, I I've I noticed a lot of PS4 that. PS5 yeah. games that do that. I, I've it's noticed like, some do it for like some of the really big story cutscenes or Persona Five. As soon as you reach a certain point, they turn it off. But like, mm-hmm. uh, they do it the whole game. <laughs> Anytime oh. there's a cutscene, <laughs> <laughs> that's the. So, I was just gonna go say ahead. the PS4 had the HD HDCP. Yeah, that yeah. would like anytime you try to record stuff. Like when you first set up an Elgato, you're like, oh, it doesn't work. And then you, all the you online guys are like, turn this off. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that it blocks through HDCP. It's just like it disables the in-game sharing. Gotcha. Stuff. Right. Oh, uh, right, right, right. But yeah, it, it's in the PS 
collection, PlayStation collection, if you have a PS5 and have PlayStation Plus, uh, I'd recommend giving a shot. It's pretty cheap. Otherwise, still, I think it's like 20 bucks. It's worth it for that much. Um, a shot. The other game I just started playing uh, is Tales of Fantasia. This is an old game. <laughs> okay. Uh, if, if you're familiar with the Tales series, they really only started bringing them to the U.S. at the GameCube time with Symphonia. Uh, and the most recent ones, Berseria. I love that series dearly. I've always wanted to go back and play some of the really ancient ones and see if they're good. So had to totally emulate that. Definitely had to, yep. Uh, and use the fan translation because the English translation for Tales of Fantasia is bad. <laughs> <laughs> the official one translated Ragnarok as kangaroo. That's not a joke. That's better, though. <laughs> I love Thor Kangaroo. <laughs> Ah, uh, yes, Thor Kangaroo. Uh, oh, so cool. yeah, I, I've been playing it that way. I'm not too far in, but the amount that's the same from 1995 when this game, this is the first Tales game, came out to 20, I think 16 or 17 when the most recent one came out is a lot more than I thought there would be. <laughs> uh, pretty much all the systems were there. They have cooking. They have the like action battle that's very different from all the other jrpgs that are turn-based um mm -hmm. that everyone's finally using now which is weird yeah like final fantasy 7 basically just has tails combat <laughs> <laughs> uh which is a weird thing but like they have that and it's back on like super nintendo it's, it's not good combat's not good back then but you can see where they were starting they had all the same items they had abilities like all the core concepts are there, and I'm I'm honestly shocked for how little I've played of it so far, how much of it sticked throughout the series. Awesome, <clears throat> yeah. I've uh, I, we were talking about this last week, but uh, I I've never actually sat down and played a JRPG, so I think I'm gonna go play a certain game having to do with time and triggering. But um, <clears throat> that's a good one. Uh, only because I, like it's been recommended a bunch of times, and uh, like it's a solid game to like get in, get out. But I don't think that... it ages as well as most people think it does, but that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> that's exciting. I need to. That's like one horizon that I've never gone and visited. I don't think I would like it, but then there's part of me that's like, maybe you'll love this. The only, the only downside that's constant through JRPGs is they're all long. Yeah. Like, they're all yeah. very long. There's no getting around that. <laughs> but, yeah. like, when it comes to, like, fighting and the mechanics and stuff, they can be very different. You just have to find the right one. Yeah, that's that sounds, that that's that's you. what intrigues me the most when you were saying the combat system. Because, to me, yes, all JRPGs are the same. So, nope. if there's things... <laughs> no, it's true. <laughs> I'm making a broad statement. <laughs> I'd say like About nothing I know. <laughs> in terms of like action y combat, like the most recent Final Fantasy VII remake is the best you're gonna get. Yeah. I think. But like the Tales games have very active combat and are not at all turn based, so they're they're less boring in my eyes. Like the Yeah. As as somebody who has very little JRPG experience, my other recommendation to Will was playing the original Final Fantasy VII, because I played that for the first time last year, and it actually holds up pretty well. Some of the some of the like the like the level gaps where you got to grind a little bit suck, and some of the like yeah. menu interactions suck. But man, the story, the action, the beats, it all it all still lands really well. Yep. Um, some of it's even more fun. relevant to current times than when it was made. <laughs> yep. Story wise, yeah, just a definitely right? longer than than chrono trigger though but but that was a game where i started playing it and it sucked me in immediately with the story it was great yeah, yeah maybe i'll snag that on this seems like a smart buy um as far as things i've been playing i'll do these two quickly and then we can jump to the third one uh, i've been playing a lot of red dead online with my two brothers um it is very fun uh i have to remind myself that i paid five dollars for it because you have to if you want to do anything quickly, you have to buy everything. The hunter's licenses, Ugh. like all that sort of Ugh. stuff. It is like 15 gold to get a license to unlock a whole stretch. But Ugh. I have gotten so much enjoyment out of not paying anymore. Um, 
I have, we've like sailed boats. We've done a bunch of missions. Uh, we, uh, we've been like doing daily stuff. So if you like log in every day and do like, it's like a five minute to do like one daily, you, you're like gold, uh, increase multiplies the more days you've done it in a row. And as mm-hmm. you do dailies, you get gold. And as you do missions, you get gold. So you kind of rack up gold That's and cool. money pretty fast, faster than I would have thought when we were first started playing. So it is genuinely fun. Also, that game is absolutely gorgeous. It's such a pretty game. It makes my computer yep. scream. But boy, is it a beautiful game. And it even it runs on my brother's 960. And it runs wow. on my other brother's wow. 980. So it's that is pretty interesting yeah because half the time i'm like oh look at those beautiful mountains and they're like oh (laughs) (laughs) you can't see them but they're there uh and it also (laughs) makes me want i want a next gen patch i hope they're working on a next gen patch or next gen version not patch version uh Mm -hmm. because right now it's locked to 30 on the series x um and i think also the ps5 wait a Uh, minute wait a minute Aren't PS5 owners supposed to get a free copy of GTA Online? GTA 5? Yeah, I think when it comes out, the next gen. Yeah, I think, I think they're doing like an actual upgraded version. Of yeah. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look that up real quick to fact but check. I think, I, just, I think you're right, though. It was that weird like opening of the PS5. <laughs> when everyone's me. like, oh, yeah, GTA 6, sweet. <laughs> and then they're like, five, and everyone immediately was like, oh. <sighs> Which you can get a Russian submarine in that game now. Gotta go back. Okay, here we go. It is download the standalone version of GTA Online to keep for free exclusively for PS5 players for the first three months from the game's launch in 2021. So yeah, first three months it'll be free gotcha. for PS5 players. Which it's funny too, because like Red Dead Online so far is pretty civil and nice. Like people like ride past you, like you don't yeah, really nice. do anything, versus GTA is just a hellscape. Yeah. Um yep. Yeah, so that's been fun. Uh, moving on, <clears throat> I started playing Shroud of the Avatar, Forsaken Virtues. Um, it is an MMO. It is by Richard Garriott, who made Ultima, all the Ultima games. And mm-hmm. it is written by Tracy Hickman, who uh, wrote a lot of stuff for TSR and Dungeons & Dragons, invented Ravenloft with his wife, wrote the Dragonlance series. Um, came out in 2014. It's not great but (laughs) you just it's no you don't pick a class and you just level up constantly and it's amazing i just walk around spamming the health spell and i keep casting health on myself and the the thing goes up and it's uh it's it's uh it's free it's on steam it's like two gigabytes highly recommend it it is it is just level up the game and it's it's very good. I really enjoy it. We, um, we literally had a conversation during Tuesday's stream about how all I want in an MMO is for it to be like an incremental idle game, like Cookie Clicker. Yes, where you're just I was just going to make the comparison. <laughs> that is all it is. It is. I would love it. Fantastic. Definitely go check it out. Um, I know I was holding my tongue on Tuesday when you were saying that. Um, uh, David, for, if you don't know, we have a series called Server Quest where we're going through the history of uh, MMOs. And so we're playing World oh, of Warcraft. Cool. Okay. Uh, you had said you were playing World of Warcraft. I didn't know what the reason you were going back was. Yeah. Um, I, I also just go back to the game. It's the ultimate podcasting game. Just That's true. Lose so That's much 100% time. true. Um, and so the third game I played this week is Monster Hunter World. I finally did it. I played Monster Hunter World. I heard the load times were bad, so I waited until the Xbox Series X came out. Uh, even before they announced it, I was waiting for it. And the load times are great. It's like half a second. Um, that game is fun, and it's teaching me things about myself I didn't know. Which is, I when I when a game's like, hey, you're in a mission, my brain goes, you gotta do this. You need to, you need to go. And I had to tell my brain, no, I'm gonna sit here and cook some meat and sharpen my sword and wander over to where the monster is shoot him a bunch till he limps away then i'm gonna cook some meat and i'm gonna yep. so ian i know you've been playing it as well how, how far are you in it so yeah so unplanned coincidentally i also started playing monster hunter world because as i said i've been bouncing between games trying to find something that'll hold my attention and this is one 
that like Piku Niku has stuck with me. I think I have about five or six hours on my save and I am up to the point where you are going to try to capture big monster in the ravine in the desert. Oh. How is that? Where, where are you at? Uh, I want to say I'm, I guess I'm not, I just, I fought the lizard flying squirrel thing. Oh, and the water. Wait, so beam. you haven't, f so you haven't fought the T-Rex yet? No. Oh, okay. So I'm I'm just a couple monsters past you. Yeah, like maybe. So three, I, I fought that that uh, steam guy in the desert. Not steam guy, but like rock guy in the. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's it's fun. Uh, what weapon are you using? So I started out using the longsword because I I know weapon is important in this, and I know they're pretty different. So I like looked at a bunch of guides that were that were was literally just like best weapon for monster hunter world beginners, and they had a couple of them. <laughs> And the one that stuck out to me was longsword. People were like, this is just nice and easy. It's a great balance. And I was using the longsword. And guess what, folks? It sucks. I hate it. So I almost dropped this game after the first hour. It's just like, it's not like a giant sword. So it's not like it's terribly slow, but it's a little slow. It has a thrust that is very particular. And it was just not, not enjoyable. So then I did some more research and I found the dual blades and I've been using the dual blades and they are incredible, folks. You get in close to somebody, but you're just like getting close and you go, <laughs> and all these numbers fly off and then you just roll out of the way and then you have a demon mode where if you really want to punish them you like literally like switch to demon mode and then you go into a blade dance where you're stationary for like six to ten seconds so it's a little dangerous a little risky but you're just like <laughs> <laughs> and it's so much better when you find the weapon that you enjoy uh what weapon are you using will uh three words for you Ian: bow and arrow it is yeah. so good it, i heard that i heard that but i didn't want to do a shooter i wanted to do so, a melee yeah you know? so i i started with the long sword didn't like it switched the knives didn't like them Switched the katana used that for a bit which back to the knives because chris said try the knives again and i still kind of <laughs> didn't like them and then wait, chris, wait, when you're saying knives you mean the dual blade dual blades yeah. okay gotcha and then uh he had also said bow and arrow so i was like check out the Bow and arrow is king. It's just like you're just rolling around right next to it, just shooting it a bunch. And then <laughs> you you hit B to do like this quick shot. And then you also do a quick shot into the air and it rains like rock arrows onto it. And so if you catch it at the right time, it's just like constant damage. It's incredible. Um, it, it's got power out shots. There's also all these different coatings you can put on the arrow points and all this sort of stuff. I don't know. It's it changed the game for me because I was thinking of dropping it. I was like, I'm really yep. not enjoying this. Um, other question: Are you did you stick with the guardian armor? Yeah. So I think the guardian armor. I don't know if that was like a pre order DLC. If we're just getting it from the game pass, but like the guardian armor. I don't, these probably aren't accurate stats. The Guardian Armor is like 50 defense and you get it from the beginning and everything else you can craft at the beginning is like six. So it's the, like, the I'm just so going to have this OP armor set. I looked know? it up. The Guardian Armor is for people who buy the game and want to get to Iceborne as fast as possible. Oh, well, I'm going to keep wearing it because I don't want to, I don't like dying. <laughs> yeah. in any so I was so. wearing it on the first couple of monsters and then I switched to the chain mail and I was like, oh, I need to heal a lot. <laughs> so yeah. I, i've stuck with it but it's just like oh i'm playing this game very differently now <laughs> like, oh boy um that would awesome. be interesting if you get to iceborne after you use <laughs> the whole time if you just like if you Terrible just get your face game. kicked in yeah <laughs> <laughs> um but i I'm, I'm really enjoying it i i think it's like the hunts they're like you have to hunt this monster and you have a 50 minute timer but i'm finding them they're more like 20 to 30 minutes which is kind of perfect for me to be like let me do a hunt real quick i load up the game i play a hunt and it's just like okay i'm good and then i move on from there is, is that kind of your experience as well yes i heard exactly what you said which is you go and do a hunt you come back do things and... well the, yeah uh, the next one thing... topic next topic i do want to talk about <laughs> i'm also playing it you talk about load times I'm I'm playing it on my Series X, but I'm also playing it on my One X, which granted has an SSD in it. But the load times are not that bad. Like like they're probably on the Series X, they're probably what like five, maybe ten second load times. On the One X, they're 
maybe 20, maybe 30 seconds. So it's really it not the, that bad. I think it was the one. Just the yeah, I could one that. that had really bad. Not SSD. Because that, that game came out before the X, right? The One X. I think it came maybe. out in 2017. The One X came out. The One X came out before Red Dead. Yeah, Monster Hunter World came out December 2017. Yeah, so I think I think the One X came out 2018. I'm not sure. I think you're right. But on the One X, though, oh no, it also uh, came out 2017. Oh, so the maybe time. they were at the same time. But it does. Um, I just remember people can play this. It does play like. I can't tell if it's a solid 30 FPS or if it's going above that, whereas on the Series X, it's a solid 60. But just yeah. to say, at least if you have a One X, it's still going to run fine on that. Um, and it's in Game Pass, so play the game. Folks. The funny thing is it has all the One X options in the Series X, so I had to look up what to set it to to make sure I was getting the best performance. Yeah. Stuff. Um, yep. So that has been the games we have been playing, folks. We're going to move on to what I like to call the news. And we got a little jingle. Uh oh, Maggie's here oh interrupting. <laughs> <laughs> she um, didn't know about the mustache. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, let me play this jingle here. Here we go. And on those today, there have been 17 dead men. I, I don't re Oh, we're playing the main intro. Oh. I don't well, remember. thanks for joining, folks. It's been a great episode. <laughs> I don't remember. Wherever you got that audio for that, I don't remember ever saying that. <laughs> you, I think you said it on our previous podcast in the very first episode. And I like I just threw to you and I was like, well, what's our news theme? And then you just said it. <laughs> and then I put music under it. I say 17 dead mammals in my fridge, I think. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, yep. love, love dead mammals in my fridge. Okay, we're gonna pivot to the news. Uh, this will be the first time I've talked about the news. Um, but the second oh, podcast, definitely will be the first time. <laughs> definitely. Um, uh, <laughs> I have a note here that I wrote this morning, which is "Ship my PS5, you cowards," and that was directed at GameSpot, GameStop, because they haven't shipped my PS5 yet. Guess what? They shipped my PS5. It'll be here Saturday. Literally hey, this afternoon. Congrats. GameStop didn't tell me. FedEx told me. <laughs> GameStop <laughs> still hasn't told me. But FedEx, I, I was very happy because it's like signature required and everything. And I was like, oh, I'm going to have to take a day off work. But then it said Saturday. And I was like, oh, thank mm. God. So that's out of the way. First off, we were talking about this earlier today. Um, this was announced on Monday. That Lucasfilm Games is now, now the new umbrella for all Lucasfilm games. That that fixes everything, right? Everyone's happy now. So I, I'm sorry, I don't understand. So LucasArts died, right? <laughs> yes. And now they're yes. kind of quote unquote bringing it back as a publishing arm called Lucasfilm Games, or or is it not even publisher? It's just a label. I think it's I just understand. a label. Well, so the difference between LucasArts and this is. LucasArts was the in-house team yeah. yes, that made the games. Team. Versus this is the in-house overseers of people making games for Disney. And yeah. I, I have a quote that is probably... It talks about this, and it's slightly more revealing. It says, quote, Lucasfilm Games is now the official identity for all gaming titles from Lucasfilm, a name that encompasses the company's rich catalog of video games. So still not sure exactly because it doesn't sound like the publisher. Pretty sure it's not a developer. I I, I think they're really just focusing on finding the right studios to license their IPs to to make games. Okay. I don't think they're I don't think they're publishing them themselves. I think they're using that Marvel games kind of template that they established a few years ago where mm -hmm. Like Spider-Man for PS4 was published and developed, well, published by Sony, developed by Insomniac, and they were just like, "Hey, we saw what you did with your previous games. We know you're a good studio. Would you like Spider-Man?" Gotcha. Yeah. So they're like, they're 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 the the official keepers of the canon and the partnerships, etc. Gotcha. Yeah, and I think they're still reviewing all the like lore stuff that comes out to make sure it's still consistent in their universe because they said, I, I think they said it at their press release where. Anything that comes from a Lucasfilm Games game is considered canon. So okay. 
they're trying to keep things organized, but they're not, I don't think they're publishing. It's really just licensing and coordinating. Yeah. I've always liked that about Star Wars, which is different from Marvel is Marvel comic books and movies are separate and TV shows versus Lucasfilm or uh, Star Wars stuff. Even before uh, the purge, everything interacted with everything. So it was a much easier to like read a book and be like, Oh, that happened to Luke Skywalker versus like, Oh, that happened to Iron Man, but not really because it didn't yeah, have an Iron think, Man movie. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's, I think that's probably one of the biggest mistakes of the MCU Marvel era, et cetera. You know, I, yeah. I feel like part of the Avengers failing was because they weren't using the likeness. They were getting really close, but they weren't using the likeness and they they have an interesting story, but it's not really tied in. Also the gameplay sucks. Yeah. But, I was going to say, I think the game just sucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, rip LucasArts. I'm sad, but it's exciting uh, that there's a lot of more, a lot more people that can now have an avenue of pitching their Star Wars game. And I mean, I bet a lot of people have dumb Star Wars games, but I bet there's a couple good ones out there that will, will. be able to find a home. Yes. What's your Star Wars game pitch? Um, I, can I? I'm gonna reuse mine, which is Hideo Kojima's Star Wars game. That's stupid. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just want to say, if David gave that answer, he's a guest, I would be nice to him. <laughs> well, that's a very stupid answer. That's like me saying, like, Keanu Reeves' movie. It's, you just... <laughs> oh, Kurt Keanu Cameron Reeves needs book. a Star Wars movie. Let's go. <laughs> no, I want Hideo like, Kojima that, to make a Star Wars nothing. game. That says, I mean, that barely says anything, That says though. everything. I want, like, I want details. I want a sequel. Do you remember that Gungan game where it was like the Sims, but you were managing the bio life of the Gungans <laughs> no. on the boot? See, Don't no, know this existed. I'm silencing you. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about okay? What was it? Was it called Empire at War, which was the oh, Age of Empires yeah. engine, but it was Star Wars RTS? Like, give me that. You know, I mean, or I could I'm... just say, Kojima game. Oh, shut up! Shut up! <laughs> shut your dumb mouth. Oh, my other answer is uh, remaster Star Wars Obi Wan because. A very good game, Republic Commando 2. <gasps> oh, a lot that's the one a lot of people have been throwing around. David, you got any Star Wars games you want to be made? Uh, I'll reuse the one from earlier, which was I want id Software to make a Dark Forces game. Oh, that was a good answer. I that's like, I answer. want that to happen. Um, another one is I would like uh, the game that any Amy Hennig, <laughs> Amy Hennig Project Ragtag to basically be revived <laughs> or 13 13 yeah, yeah or I, either one <laughs> really just like i want more single player narrative star wars games that yeah. is new stuff not just like like i want to see some cool bounty hunter stuff man like like give me a boba fett or Django game come on <laughs> i want i want like a non-violent slice of life <laughs> game where you're just a civilian in the star wars universe you know what? You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I want a water farmer game because I want to know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the moisture evaporator like broke again. Tatooine moisture farmer. That's there's moisture farmer, not water farmer. Farm <laughs> it's the same thing. I, I guarantee someone has said water farmer in the Star Wars universe as an insult. <laughs> you just farm water. <laughs> We live in a desert. It's a hard life. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Have you tried to farm water in a desert? <laughs> oh. You know, when you think oh, about boy. it, they're just giant. Uh, I had the word. What are those things that you put in basements to make it dry? Um, a dehumidifier. Yeah, they're just giant dehumidifiers I mean, uh, in the middle yeah. of the desert. But how do you dehumidify that, what is not, what, that which is not humid? <laughs> You know, there's <laughs> potential for a crossover between the Tatooine moisture farmers and the still suits of the Dune universe Dude. that the Fremen used. <laughs> Shut up about Dune. It sucks. <laughs> it doesn't suck. It's weird. It suck. <laughs> um, moving on, we'll keep this in the realm. Uh, they also announced uh, the same day as the Lucasfilm game stuff, the following they day. are making. An Indiana Jones game. Was the Indiana Jones the following day? Yeah, I Lucas. Know, I think it was the following day. Loose yeah. Film Games was Monday, and he was Tuesday. Oh, okay, I think you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, get your fedoras and whips ready, folks. New Indiana Jones game coming from Machine Games, makers of 
the two recent Wolfenstein games and produced, executive produced by the Todd Howard, my my hero. Honestly, can I ask you a question? I want honest take. I want honest minutes here. Are you excited for this game? What are your expectations here? I'm extremely. I love Indiana Mine, Jones. Kind of low, to be honest with you, because Machine Games, the two Wolfs and Time games, we're just going to ignore Young Blood. Uh, fantastic story, fantastic world building. The gameplay wasn't that good. Um, Todd Howard. Eh, you know, eh. <laughs> I will say he's, he's at least executive producing it and not. Like, if he was game designer, I'd be a little less excited. But yeah. he is yeah, someone that like director. actively likes Indiana Jones. So at least there's a little bit of excitement for the project. Also, I really like Emperor's Tomb for uh, the Xbox. That game was really good. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Just is that an Jones. indie game or is that a Todd Howard game? It's an Indiana Jones game in the <laughs> oh, Emperor's <okay>. Tomb. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You would have been totally uh, right either way. <laughs> but I, I, I think the other thing is that I'm trying to think of what this game is, and it just feels like a really like big budget triple a i don't want to say uncharted like game where it's just like oh press this button to whip across the chasm now yeah. run from the boulder and i just like the one of the great things that machine games has been doing with wolfenstein is like completely blowing like storytelling and world building convention out of the water and i don't think they're going to be allowed to do that with indiana jones you know like i think if machine games made an indiana jones movie that game that they wanted to then at the end of it it would be revealed that Indiana Jones is secretly a Nazi all along. You know, it would have yeah. some crazy clip like that. It would be crazy. I will and they're say, not going to be allowed to do that. There's so, a lot of third-party okay. Indiana Jones stuff that's very good. Yeah, and, and it's just, when I think about what this game is, it just feels like it's going to be a very well-polished, but ho-hum, vanilla, middle-of-the-road AAA game. And that's really disappointing to me. So I, 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 I'm not trying, trying not to judge the game before it's released, yeah. but it's hard for me to get excited because yeah. I, I, I just I don't think they're going to make an exciting indie game based on what I'm seeing so far. I mean, it's a triple A game. <laughs> I'm kind of with you. My expectations are low, but my hopes are like medium to high. Yeah, like, yeah. Exactly. I, I think, I, I think there's been a trend lately of a lot of the, the big studios when they get to make a game that's not in the genre they're known for. They've kind of been knocking it out of the park recently. That's um, true. The one that comes to mind is um, Horizon Zero Dawn. Like mm -hmm. that studio had been making Killzone for their entire existence, which wasn't even known as a great shooter. It was just a shooter, yeah. <laughs> and they went on to make Horizon, which I haven't played yet. But uh, tons of people love that game. Uh, same thing for uh, Respawn. They've been making shooters, and I know. I know, Will, you don't feel this way, but <laughs> uh, Jedi Fallen Order, tons of people love that game. And yeah. nothing like what they've done for the past, <clears throat> however long that studio existed, even before that studio existed, because everyone had come from Infinity Ward. They just made shooters the whole time. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think there, I have a little bit of hope of maybe Machine Games has the ability to do that, and that's why they were given the project. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think I, I think I'm right there with you. Yeah, and I almost wonder if like someone in that studio was like, "I got to make something else," and then they like did a little tech demo, like yeah. a lot of studios do, or had like a little game jam, and then they were like, "Hey, what if we pitched this to Lucasfilm, something like that, and got yeah. a ball rolling or whatever?" Um, mm. Okay, so moving on, uh, we'll do this one quick because we kind of already talked about some of it. Uh, they also announced that uh, Ubisoft Massive Entertainment, who made The Division One and Two. Uh, are working on a Star Wars game, supposedly open world. Um, no, no, they. I have a quote down there in the notes that I pulled directly from their release: "Brand new story-driven open world adventure." Oh, okay. That first article did not say open world. Um, the uh, Ubisoft division. No, I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm saying uh, when I when oh, the yeah, last time no, I read it. Um, you're wrong. The division two <laughs> uh, creative director will be the uh, director. Uh, using the Snowdrop engine, which I think is a great engine, uh, closes car doors very well. Uh, they're very early in development, so don't, well, I don't know why they announced it. Um, also, I was looking at some of their Wikipedia history. They were working on James Cameron's Avatar game in 2017, and that was their last thing they were working on. 
I wonder if who wasn't there, wasn't there an Avatar game that came out in like 2011 with the movie or something. I don't know. It, uh, if you go to yeah, Massive Entertainment's it list, bad. it says James Cameron's Avatar sequel game, and it just says 2017. So I wonder if that's already been dropped or something. But I, I mean, the, maybe it got pushed because the movies got pushed. Yeah, really I can't imagine back. they're still working on it. It could have been an out of date wiki. Uh, I didn't even. They might have. Up. Uh, they could have two teams too. I think it's a pretty that's big true. studio. Um, but I mean, uh, like Division One and Two are also pretty big and recent too. Yeah, Division One game is very good. I didn't like Division, but I um I don't mean to to rain on this parade again. But when I think of Division One and Two, it was like it was like a mixed bag. It was like you know the shooting was okay, and they had some really interesting mechanics like the Dark Zone. But I just never got into like the actual like gear crafting system because it was just so convoluted. And Division Two like improved some of that, especially like the wander around an open world. It felt so much better than under games like Destiny in terms of wandering around an open world with other players and dynamic things are happening. But they still didn't fix the item system and the story was convoluted, etc. So, so with this, I'm like, if they just make, you know, Star Wars Division, I'm like. I don't know that I can get excited for that. I mean, the only difference in my head between the division two and star Wars, the division is, is the set dressing. That's it. And what I really want from them is like yeah. mechanical changes to address these issues. And I, I'm not seeing that in this. So I'm like, again, I'm like, it could be cool, but I don't know. You know? Yeah. I, I think it's, I had a lot of good times in the division one. And then mm-hmm. when I first moved to New Jersey, I played a lot of division one with my friends and I had just started a job working in the city. And so it was like walking around New York City in real life and in a video game. That was pretty cool too. And <clears throat> at that point, they had done that last bulk update to the Division 1 where they like fixed a lot of stuff with like gear stuff yeah. and everything. And yeah. they made it a lot easier. So I, I really enjoyed that towards the tail end of its life. Yeah. I think they could do some cool stuff. It's like my problem with the Division was mainly like the bullet sponginess of things yeah yeah um and I, I i only played the initial release like to the end i didn't play anything any of their patches and like raids and stuff they drop later but i know a lot of people who did and they had some cool fight concepts and things for a game where you're all just like shooters so i think from that aspect if they add in like oh you can have monsters and things because it's the star wars universe like they could do some really cool stuff with that but yeah i I'm a little worried it's just going to be the Division 3 with the Star yeah. Wars skin on it. <laughs> yeah. And also with like bullet like, spongy stuff, uh, mm-hmm. that at least would, there's ways to explain that better yeah. in the Star Wars universe. Because like when you, a lot of times bullet sponge makes sense when you're a sort of games as a service loot shooter um, versus a game like, like Red Dead I've been playing where you just get headshots all the time and just kill guys yeah. immediately. Uh, at least there's a better set dressing to explain the divisionness of the division. Yeah. Could help. Mm-hmm. You had something? Yeah. Yeah. I just, I, uh, I just want to say, I'm not trying to be pessimistic. It's just like, these were supposed to be huge announcements and some people like felt like they were huge announcements, you know, like big Indiana Jones fans, et cetera. And they just weren't hitting with me that crazy. And it felt like they weren't, hitting with the game sphere in general as big as they really should whereas like something like when hogwarts legacy leaked and then it was officially announced those were like big announcements people were like finally a, a harry potter rpg i'm ready to go this looks amazing and then you look at these and it's just like yeah i guess that could be cool yeah i guess that could be cool and it's yeah. a little disappointing this is what they're leading with and none of them are like big heavy hitters i mean neither of them and it's just like i'm sure they've got more that they're going to announce but I was a little underwhelmed yeah. by like their quote unquote big announcements up front. Yeah. I think a lot of us are a little jaded from EA's handling of the licenses too, of like, well, yeah. the last AAA studio they handed this to didn't really do anything good with it till arguably Jedi Fallen Order. Yep. And now, so like, why would we think any different with these companies? So I think there's probably a little bit of that. I will say I'm yeah. giving Jedi Fallen Order a second chance because of the new update. And they've updated for console. Oh. So don't don't worry. My opinions may change on how terrible that game is. <laughs> I mean, I didn't think it was great. Like I enjoyed well, it. Yeah. But it was a buggy mess for me. I will say I played around with that photo mode a bunch because you could go anywhere and it was great. We just like click the photo mode, even in a cutscene, you could just fly around in the cutscene. I was like, 
I can't believe they're giving me this oh. much control. <laughs> but okay. Um, yeah, so you briefly mentioned EA. Uh, there's a, There were whole conjecture articles about is EA's yeah. 10 years up? Was there 10 years? Was it whatever? I think we can all agree EA kind of deprived us 10 years of Star Wars games essentially they screwed the pooch on it yeah they oh, really yeah. did i think they could have done a better job um and in the sake of time i think we're just going to move on from the galaxy far far away well, sorry i just want to say real quick just to mark this so so the deal started in 2013 it's a bad transition the deal started in 2013 the assumption is it could last through 2023 and be the full 10 years they're announcing these games now they're in early development they may not come out till 2023 but I'm I'm looking at an article here, and I think it's accurate. But if I'm not mistaken, EA has really only put out three Star Wars games in those ten years. It was Battlefront One, Battlefront Two, and Fallen Order, and Squadrons. Um, and Squadrons. Oh, and Squadrons. Yeah, so it's four total, and that is crazy considering they also had three. If I'm reading this article right, they had three other Star Wars projects announced that they eventually canceled. Like. Yep. They that that's ten years. They really just they man, I can't believe how badly they messed that up. It's crazy. Ten, ten years of them trying to figure out how to squeeze money out of Star Wars fans. I mean, they did. They put a lot of Star yeah. Wars stuff in their other games, yeah. and they they yeah, also did true. a bunch of mobile games too that were pretty like successful. Galaxy Heroes, Heroes yeah. of the Galaxy, Heroes of the Storm. Yeah. That's what it was. <laughs> Star yeah, Wars. It's just, yeah, it's just crazy. You have a giant publisher like EA. They're given a giant license like Star Wars and a huge exclusivity period of 10 years. And all they release are four AAA games and a bunch of mobile games. And it's like, what are you doing? Yes. Crazy. Anyways. So anyways, if a uh, galaxy far, far away, Will has a transition for us. I was going to say from a galaxy far, far away to a table near, nearby. Ian, can you tell us about tabletop games from 2020? <laughs> yeah, I, I came across this crazy article. Uh, it's basically just a really good summation of tabletop games for 2020. Um, here on Subpixel, we play a lot of tabletop games. Will and I play tabletop games in person, online. David, are you a tabletop gaming fan? I play tabletop games too. So yeah. Heck yeah. Uh, and if you're watching this and you don't play tabletop games, what the heck's wrong with you? Play them. <laughs> They're great. If you're listening to a video game podcast, you should absolutely be playing tabletop <laughs> games. Um, but anyway, so this article just had a bunch of like tidbits like a summary of 2020 and basically how COVID, but also increasing digitization of workspace and collaboration and social activity has changed the video game. I mean, the uh, board game industry. So a couple of key facts I want to run down here. The sad one first, according to the Game Manufacturers Association, they're estimating 20% or more of independent game stores will go out of business or already have gone out of business. Do you guys have local board game stores you like to visit? I have one that's sort of local that I'm pretty sure will be able to persist this, but yeah, that's it. That's good, yeah. I have a couple. I think one of them actually closed before COVID. I'm not sure if it was business-related or if they just didn't want to do it anymore, but I have a pretty good one nearby that was actually on an episode of Pixel 8, if you want to go games and stuff. Um, there was an interesting tidbit about one company in particular that does miniature games, like for example, they run the Fallout miniatures game, that they're embracing at-home 3D printing. So basically they're saying, look, you can try and get this, this, uh, this model from us for your tabletop game, or you can pay us five bucks and get the 3D file and print it on your own. And th isn't that crazy? That's pretty crazy. That's, that's right? awesome. Yeah, because 3D printing, it's very cheap now. It's definitely easier than it was before to do it. So it's it's cool that they're like, you know what? We're hitting manufacturing issues rather than us have to worry about shipping it to you and you can't find it. Just pay us for the model and download and print it. So that's pretty cool. It's um, good they're embracing that because I think if they didn't, there'd be a lot of small time people just throwing models out there anyway. So I, I yeah, think they yeah. had to. Exactly. Yeah. Um, the uh, use of tabletop simulator for virtual playtesting has greatly increased. David, have you have you messed around with tabletop simulator before? Yeah, I use it pretty much every other weekend now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we we we. I want to say maybe once a month and once every couple months we play a game on stream with it. We recently played Splendor using Tabletop Simulator, um, but they basically pointed out that not only is it in high use for the pandemic because people want to play board games together but they can't get together in person, but also for people who are playing tabletop games 
uh, it's much easier to prototype in Tabletop Simulator digitally than it is to constantly have to prototype and manufacture yeah. physical pieces. Yeah. And, and the interesting part was they also talked about how the Tabletop Simulator fan community, people who love to play Tabletop Simulator, are thirsty for new games. So if you show up and you're like, hey, who wants to play this game I just made? You're always going to find people who want to just try it out. Yep. Uh, which is great. Um, the last tidbit here, Kickstarter. I shouldn't have put the numbers here. It should have been a game, but it's okay. $233 million raised for board games on Kickstarter alone in 2020, which is a 32% increase versus 2019. Um, and the, the key on top of that was the game Frosthaven, which is the sequel to Gloomhaven, raised $12.9 million on its own. Crazy Kickstarter numbers. Do you guys ever bought uh, board games or puzzles off uh, Kickstarter? Yeah. Most recent one I got was uh, Trial by Trolley. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I got uh, Magic Puzzles. I don't think I've gotten any board games, but I always watch them to see if they uh, got any crazy things. First thing I ever backed was Kingdom Death Monster. Mm -hmm. Got that sitting in its box still to be put together because it came with some yeah. pictures. I, um, you know, there's... Kickstarter is has its good sides and its bad sides, but I think one of its positive sides is with board games. There are a lot of like amateur board game designers who basically it's very hard to pitch your game to a company and to get that company to buy it. Whereas if you can do enough work to get your Kickstarter launched and secure, depending on the game, anywhere between twenty to forty thousand dollars worth of sales, that's enough to make those copies of the game. Yep. So basically, if you can run a twenty or forty thousand dollar Kickstarter campaign. You can make your own board game and give it out and ship it out to people. So it's it's really lowered the cost for board game designers to to actually make something and have it at the market. Um, yeah, I just kind of wanted to bring that up because board gaming, video gaming, they go hand in hand. Yeah, twenty twenty has been a weird year, but board gaming it's booming. Awesome. Uh, moving on, uh, David. I know you didn't get to talk about this on around the monitor, but do <laughs> you want to talk about cyber cyber hump cyberpunk? <laughs> Cyberpunk. Oh, I play that game. <laughs> 20, 20, I mean, that is what it is. Our commitment <laughs> to quality. Oh boy. Uh, side uh, note: Chris and yeah. I discovered uh, Cyber Slut 2069, which is a porn game <laughs> using the oh. cyberpunk assets to lure people yes. into them, thinking it's that. I tweeted it. it a while ago, and it was so That's very funny. We got as far as them were... wanting a credit card, and we we bowed out. Oh. <laughs> I thought I thought you were saying that you had invented that phrase, and I was like, "We need to market that immediately." That <laughs> <laughs> oh, was very good. Oh man, I guess in a nutshell, CDPR released on Twitter a five-minute video of like their head, I forget if the studio head or founder or both um, apologizing with the strongest air quotes I can possibly give for their mistakes that they mm -hmm. made during their release um it was it's open to interpretation but my interpretation of it was pretty much the c-suite of that company threw their qa under the bus of like qa didn't find all these bugs that the gamers found it's qa's yeah. problem and then they also blamed uh previous gen hardware which is one of the worst excuses possible for them since they were planning on releasing it exclusively on PS4 and Xbox One yep. before they pushed the date this year or yep. in the past year. So that's not an excuse that is real. Um, you knew the hardware you were developing for and you just chose not to develop for it. Uh, yeah. That's on you, buddy. And they, they yeah. were blaming the consoles. It It was a very odd thing for them to put out after all of this yeah it made it worse. I, I i kind of feel bad for the guy who was doing the video because i don't think i don't think these are his lies i think this is literally middle management being like we really screwed up but who who or what else can we blame it on what are some excuses that people may buy other than just we were pushed to to go out with a crappy product and then this guy comes on and is well, basically he, just he like he is a like C level person at CDPR. Yeah, he yeah. Knew. <laughs> but what I mean is like what I mean is like he knew there were problems, and these are the problems that he was told. 
Like this, these are the excuses he was given by his managers. And so he's presenting those excuses with a happy face when nobody wants to address the underlying issue, which is like bad project management, horrible decisions, like overtime stress, financial stress, et cetera. Nobody wants to say those out loud. So these are the best excuses. They can come up at with. the top that like they saw the game and they okayed it. Yeah. Like, which is a lie. That's, that's bad. Yeah. If you're, if you run a game company and you let a game go out the door without you having played it and seen it running on a bunch of different systems, you have failed as the person running a game studio. Yeah. <laughs> and and I guarantee you they they were not that you know that whole that whole line about QA didn't see the bugs that you were seeing, oh, which is like true. almost a direct quote, that's is BS. So and like BS. we didn't know how bad it ran on the old gen is just like I can, I can, the only way, okay, so I, you know, I have seven years of QA experience, one year of that in the video game industry, and there was literally a QA team that all they were doing was playing the new, the new builds of the game every single day on a PS4 and an Xbox One, and they knew the entire cert process back to front, and every time they played a build, they were literally just going, will this pass cert, yes or no, and every time something failed, they would put it in as a bug and say, this specific thing won't pass cert. Frame rate dip too low in this area, et cetera, et cetera. Well, and they bypass certification, so there's <laughs> Yeah. So it's like, if you do not have that process in place, that is terrible. But I guarantee you they do have that process in place, and all those concerns were just ignored. That there are plenty of people at the studio who knew exactly what was going on, and nobody wanted to take the hard decision every, to go. Everyone knew. Yeah. yeah, but nobody wanted to make the hard decision to say, we need to delay, we need to cancel current gen, we need to actually fix these issues. Yeah. It was always just, it's too big of a problem, so we're just going to ignore it and hope it's not really an issue. And people were saying and they couldn't get up. away with another delay, and they could have easily memed it have. off. Easily. They could have. Easily. Yeah. It would have. It yeah. would not have cost them this much reputation to have nope. delayed again. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm going to say, delay it a year and cancel the, the last gen versions. You know, you say, look... We're going to cancel the, the the last gen versions. We're going to wait a year so you guys can have more time doing the getting those consoles because they're hard to get right now. And that's going to give us more time to perfect the game. And if it was a 2021 fall release in a little bit better state and we wouldn't have the last gen debacle, it would not be nearly as badly received as it is. They could cancel the multiplayer thing they were talking about because apparently yeah. that's still on board. Like they're still doing that. And I'm like, why at this point? Yeah, right. Oh, yeah. the other thing they did that was just funny. Uh, they released a roadmap. Um, oh, yeah. It's not a roadmap. Yeah. As so I'm a product manager at my software company, very similar things. Um, if I turned in that roadmap to anyone, they would literally just laugh and yeah. hand it back to me, like, good joke. Where's the actual roadmap? <laughs> Actually, if I'm not mistaken, the, the front half of the roadmap was just the hot fixes they already yes. released immediately after launch. It was like like front third. Them. It was like front yeah. third, and they're like, "Yeah, we hot fix things," and everyone's like, "Well, the game's still busted, and we can't buy it on PlayStation." Yeah. <laughs> I, can't I, I, I also i I can't believe they're still planning to do a next gen version of the game because I played it on the Series X, and you know what? That is not a priority right now. It runs well enough on the Series X; you don't need to make a next gen version. Don't put dev resources towards that. Put it towards fixing all these bugs and issues, etc. You don't need to pretty up. It, you don't need to pretty it up on the Series X because it, it already looks pretty great, except for the bugs. You know, it's crazy, man. Crazy. What a horrible <laughs> release. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's just it boggles my mind that this happened. Like, I, it, just, it just keeps going. Keeps getting worse. Yeah, like the response to it is awful. They just can't uh, own up to it. Oh, Cyberpunk. Anyways, um, yeah, I. I honestly, I just want to talk about them, but we can't. Um, earlier, yeah, we had my PS5 stock update, but now, Ian, what's the PS5 restock update for the rest of humanity? Yeah, so this uh, this comes from a quote unquote rather reliable stock update tipster uh, called PS5 UK Stock Instant Updates Twitter account. Uh, this comes from an article from Tom's Guide. Uh, they they felt like this is a verified enough individual that they can post this as a news item. But essentially, Sony has told uh, retailers that they're going to deliver three to four million new PS5 consoles a month over the next few months, which is more than they've been able to deliver so far. So just a quick little news bit for those of you who are still struggling to find a PS5, 
Sounds like things should be getting easier in the coming months. Uh, Will, you've got your PS5. David, it sounds like you have a PS5 as well. I've got my PS5. Uh, <laughs> it's enormous. Uh, um, it's almost as big as the poster. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I actually, I, I took my recycling out the other day and I had this giant box and I was like, what came in this box? And it's literally like 20 by 30 inch box. And I was like, oh, that's right. It was the PS5 that came in this <laughs> giant box. Um, so yeah, so if you if you want a PS5, they're going to be easier to get in the coming months. If you want a, an RTX card, it's going to get even worse and they're even more expensive right now. So uh, welcome to hell. I'm right there with you. <laughs> wow. Um, well, it's been an hour. I don't want to keep yeah. anyone. Uh, so I'm just going to run through these last ticket items real fast, and then uh, we'll get the heck out of here for all of you folks. I uh, just want to mention Mass Effect Legendary Edition possibly coming out in March. There was a leak on a some website saying a date, uh, so they think Legendary Edition come out in March. Yeah. I believe um, it was it was two separate retailers that leaked the date at the same time. Gotcha. Kind of looking forward to that. Not really. I, I, I'm almost done with the Giant Bomb playthrough of Mass Effect. And that has satisfied any need I have to play Mass Effect. So, kind of. Yeah. Uh, Plus, I don't. You don't know what this is. Is this just HD texture pack, or have they actually that done too. some update to it? It you know? sounds like they're updating one. I don't know if they're updating two and three, because basically they went back and played one, and we're like, "Ooh, this doesn't age as well as the others," which is correct. It does. Yeah. Not. It's remaster <laughs> Kotor. That's all. That's all I want. Um. I'd also. Be for that. Yeah. Also, Hogwarts Legacy was delayed to 2022. Speaking of delays, this is how you do it properly. You announce it well before the end of the year or well before your targeted release date from before. You say a nice little message like, hey, we have an announcement. We're sorry to say this. And then everyone understands it and no one gets mad because you didn't say it's coming out next week and now you're changing it 19 days before it comes out. Um, I have the little quote here. Uh, they said, creating the best possible experience for all the wizarding world and gaming fans is paramount to us. So we're giving the game at the time it needs Hogwarts legacy will be released in 2022. Good for you. I'm looking forward to that game. Release it when it needs to be released. Stop announcing could games use early. Some breathing room from JK Rowling too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, JK. Um, <laughs> and finally Pokemon snap new Pokemon, Pokemon snap game sequel. Nobody wanted comes out April 30th. Excuse me. <laughs> Pokemon is stupid and I hate it. The one opinion I did not express on the previous podcast I was on today. Um, oh, that would have been a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, it would have been a bad idea. I have, nothing, I have nothing against Pokemon game mechanics. I just don't like Pokemon. Um, that's the worst opinion. Yeah, I know, the, right? The game mechanics is the one you should have opinions against. Uh, I don't like cute animals. Everything else is okay, but I don't like cute cartoon animals. All of them suck except Oddish. We all know this. It's Oddish. true. Oddish is the Have best. you never seen Halucha? Halucha? What is wrong he's with He's a luchador Pokemon. <laughs> well, yeah, he's a hawk with a, with a luchador. And Only then you the can 151 are good. Just a, just a and they're all edible. Um, Harkronium's calling me a heretic. I'm sorry, Harkronium. Uh, <laughs> See, you riled up our chat. <laughs> our one chatter. <laughs> <laughs> Who has been here the whole time, and I love you. Um, so, yeah. That is the show. I've been really bad about changing the pictures today. I apologize. I try to I try to do it like a slideshow and make it cool. I'm gonna play the outro music, which is just the intro music, not in reverse. Um, folks, Ian, David, thanks for joining me. David, thanks for joining last minute and taking yeah, no more time out of your life to talk about video games. Um, West Coast is not so late even for me. So. Oh, that's true. <laughs> oh yeah, because you asked how how late it goes, and I said ten, and I go, I should probably say an hour. I was like, I don't know where he lives. I know you live by Chris, so <laughs> that's true. Oh, uh, it's the most unfortunate. Um, folks, if you like this, you can check out all of our stuff right here on the YouTube channel. If you're somehow watching this somewhere else, that is subpixelfilms.com. It'll bring you straight to our YouTube channel, where you can check out all of our lovely archives and videos. Ooh, boy, I am sick of talking today. Uh, Ian, any last minute thoughts for the folks at home? Yeah, um, Pokemon is great, and I wish I was more optimistic about video games, but I'm just not. I guess I'm a bit of a miser, and you can find me on Twitter at ThinkGibson. David, how about you? 
Uh, sure, come check out the channel I work on, uh, Around the Monitor, youtube.com slash Around the Monitor, Twitter, at Round the Monitor, the at signs the A, because there's a character limit. Uh, yeah, we do some cool stuff. A lot of shows very much like this, so if you like this, come check us out. Yes, definitely check them out. They have some great stuff, uh, including a new video that just came out uh, about... Uh, I just blanked Development out. of Shovel Knight. Development of Shovel Knight, thank you. They also have a great uh, Ace Attorney series that is also good. The song's about to end, so we're going to go ahead and get the heck out of here. Have